Okay. Um, let's see. So we're going to talk about bee trees, the last wrap up of bee trees. And we'll also start talking about heaps uh, and implementation of priority queues. And uh, let's see, there's still a uh, midterm uh, on Thursday, and there is a uh, homework three that's due a week after that. Uh, okay, so today's plan is the bee tree wrap up and then uh, talking about priority queues. So the warm up for the wrap up is. Uh, if I have a B tree with uh, uh, 128, uh, maximum 128 children per node, so this is an M area tree with M is 128, then I'm asking if I have such a tree of height four, what's the smallest number of items, key value pairs, that could be in that tree. So it has to contain at least some number of items. And there are six choices. It's a lot of choices. So I'm going to let you think about this for approximately, I don't know, how much time do you want? Two minutes? Three minutes? Three. Three. Okay. Three minutes. How many people have a selection, a choice? One, two. If I gave you another minute, would you have more choices? No? Yes? Okay, let's vote. It's height four. I just drew uh, one arm of a B tree of height four. I mean, I didn't draw everything here. It's got lots of stuff in it. Um, 
but uh, but each how how many how many children in a, are in a B tree for that node? At least sixty four m over two. So this is there's a, there's has to be all of the uh, internal nodes in a tree are half full. They're half full of splitter keys, and so there have to be at least about m over two children. But the root, the root is the weird one, right? The root can actually only have two children if it's an internal node, so we only know that this is two. But every one of the internal nodes has a branching of m over two. And in addition, when I get down to the leaf, how many nodes, how many keys are inside of a leaf? Remember, everything in a bee tree is half full, except for the root. So how many keys are in the leaf? Half full. Doesn't have to be totally full. Could be. It could be, but we're asking about the fewest. Like I'm asking you, the height 4B tree has to have this many keys in it. And so what you're basically doing is trying to build a very sparse height 4B tree. And so we're, we're trying to think everything is like, you know, as small as possible. And so the smallest that this could be is something like M over 2. The number of keys that are in the leaf. So if I just ask you, how many keys are at the leaves of this height 4 B tree? That's an easier question. How many keys are just at the leaves? How many are there of those? So the number of keys at leaves must be at least how much? And you, you can just, you don't have to do the multiplication, you can just tell me the formula as a function of m. We'll worry about changing it into a number later. But can you, if I tell you that I have a tree, and that tree has two children at the root, and then the children of the root have at least m over two children, and each of their descendants have at least m over two children, and each of their descendants have at least m over two children, and every one of the nodes down at the bottom has at least m over two leaves, I mean m over two keys in the leaves, how many keys are at the leaves? No? Yes? Come on, somebody say something. M over 2 to the height. Excellent. So it's M over 2. Well, it's 2 times, because there's two of these trees. And I multiply this M over 2 by this M over 2 by this M over 2. And by that M over 2, I got four of them. Each time, it's like a binary tree, right? Think about the number of leaves in a binary tree. If you have a height 1, it's 2. If it's height 2, you have 4. Like three of eight, it's going up like by a power of two. If I have a m over two airy tree, it's going up by a factor of m over two each time. First group is m over two, then each one of those, every one of those has m over two, so it's m over two squared, and then the next level would have m over two cubed, and then m over two to the fourth. So we're getting something like this many keys at the leaves, two times m over two to the fourth. In our particular case, m over 2 is about 64. So this is uh, 2 times, it's not about, it is, 64 to the 4th. How much is 2 times 64 to the 4th? No one really knows. I mean, they do. I put it into my calculator to figure it out. But you could also figure it out by looking at the binary representation of 64, which is 1 followed by a certain number of bits, 6. So you have six bits of zero after a one, and you have that to the fourth, which means you're just going six times four bits, so there's one followed by 24 bits. And then you're multiplying that by two, so it's one followed by 25 bits. So you have a binary number which is 26 bits long, and has a one in the first position, and the rest are zeros. 
what is one, what is two to the, so this is equal to two to the 25th. That's a big number. Two to the 25th. I'll tell you what it is. I was interested. And it's kind of cute, this number. It's three, three, five, five, four, four. You think the next one is? Three, two. That's how many there are at the leaves. There are also more keys at the internal nodes of the bee tree. I'm not even counting those. And already, I'm above 30 million items. So the answer is, it's going to be bigger than this. Without even counting internal. So this is just the leaves. It's the number of keys of leaves. Trying to impress on you the shallowness of really gigantic bee trees. There are only four, height four. And you, got, you have to have at least 30 million items in it. Cool. Any question about this? Yeah. Why does the know uh what is the uh origin the root? You tell me. Why does the root why is the root allowed to have two children? No. It can't have one child. But why does it have two? Why why do we have to allow it to have two? Why can't I just say the root has to have him over two children as well? Why doesn't that work? Yeah, the problem is that we need to be able to grow this tree if we add more items. And the way that bee trees grow is that they crack, they split and they split potentially all the way up to the root. Remember, there's this propagating of splits that occurs. If I fill up a leaf, that's where I insert something. If I fill it up, if it's full, if it's over full, I have to split it into two. And then, then it has to sort of pass a key up to the parent and say, hey, there's another child here. You need another splitter. A parent gets that key. And then the parent says, oh, great. Now I'm full, and I have to split. So I tell the grandparent, right? Here's another key, and then it splits, 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 split. It potentially could split all the way up. At any point in that stage, it could be done. But if it goes all the way up to the root, and you split the root, it splits into two, and the new root has two children. One for each of those two. So it's a, it's a, it also is because if you have a very small tree, this is a good way to represent a small, a small, not small number of items. And you have a way to represent it as a bee tree as well. Yep. This uh, is the root, which has two children. Oh, okay. Each one of those children is has to obey the the real capacity constraint, which is that every node has at least is at least half full. So for all the remaining nodes in the tree, they're at least half full. But the root may not be. That's right. That's correct. There's even more if I counted all the ones that are at the internal nodes. For example, there's one up at the root level. How many are at the next level? How many keys are at the next level? At least. Well, that's going to be something like m over 2, because that's well, it's going to be m over 2 minus 1, because that's the number of keys that need to be used in order to make m over 2 branches. And there's two nodes with that one. So there's that. And then how many are at the next level? So that's the number at this level. How many are at this level? Well, there's two children of the root, 
And each one of those children has m over 2 children. So that means there's 2 times m over 2 grandchildren. And each one of the grandchildren has m over 2 minus 1 keys in it. So that's at the next level. You can sort of see how it goes. In the next level, we get 2 times m over 2 squared times m over 2 minus 1. And then 2 times m over 2 cubed times m over 2 minus 1. And that counts all the internal, counts all the keys that are in, 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 that are in internal nodes. On an exam, do we have to worry about uh, constant factors like plus or minus one because n is odd or something like that? Or well, you know, it really depends on the question. I mean, if the question is all about like you know the fact that the number of keys in a node is one less than the number of children of the node, then yes, you have to pay attention to that minus one. But if the question is about count the number of nodes in the tree, I don't think we would ever put something on the exam that says, can you tell me if this has 33,554,431 nodes or 55 million, 33 million, whatever, whatever, whatever. That would be crazy. Mm -hmm. and, well, we are kind of crazy, but not that crazy. Okay, that's the warm up. Let's think about a little bit more about B3. This is uh, uh, just questions about what happens when you perform operations on these. When you're performing a remove operation or an insert operation, those operations typically are fast because they only involve taking a key or key value pair out of a node. And it's only in the case, on instance, for instance, on the remove, when you remove a key value pair and the node goes below capacity. That's the only problem. That's when things get a little bit difficult. And then you can always steal from your sibling in the remove case. And if you can't steal from your sibling, then you have to do this split, this sort of uh, merging, which, which brings children together. They get merged into one child. And that causes keys to disappear from parents. But it's, it's very rare, especially if M is large. Basically, you would think, well, about 1 over every M, or 1 over M, or like 2 out of every M uh, remove operations is going to cause a node to decrease so far that it actually gets critical, has to merge with the uh, sibling. So it's very infrequent. Same thing for insert. If I insert into a leaf, typically there's room. Typically there's lots of room. How about in a tree with m equals 128, I can insert 64 things into that tree, into that leaf, before it fills up. It's only about one out of every 64 times do I actually create an uh, overfull leaf that causes a split. You could even think about, like, instead of stealing from the sibling, you could also give to the sibling. So in the case you had a really, really full leaf, and it had very, very poor siblings, it could say, hey, take this. Just sort of shuffle them off. And then there wouldn't be any splitting at that point. It would just be this whole give back to your sibling thing. Uh, and so that means that propagation is rare because you, in order to split a leaf, you have to have a lot of insertions to go into that leaf in order to fill it up so that it splits. And then when it splits, it sends up one splitter key to the parent. The parent's in the same boat, right? It has room for M keys after about M over 2 insertions one of them comes up. So it's going to take like m over 2 squared insertions for it to actually fill up at the parent level, cause another split to go up another level. So it's like forever. You like put in a lot of keys to make splits happen that propagate. Um, there is some question about whether if I insert and then delete and insert and delete, if I cause thrashing, meaning the structure changes, you know, I inserted something and it caused a bunch of splits, and then I remove the thing that caused all those splits and it causes a bunch of merges. And then I insert it again and it causes a bunch of splits. So that's a possibility in these trees. But typically you can get over those poss that possibility because there's enough flexibility in the, in the sibling sharing. 
Finally, uh, you can perform range queries in these trees. So if I give you two keys and I ask you to report all the key value pairs between key one and key two, it's easy. What do you do? I knew you were dripping there. Yep. So you can find key one just by performing a find operation. And now how do you do a traversal to get all the keys between key one and key two? So, well, first of all, how much time does it take to do the find? Find key one. And that takes how much time? In an M airy B tree. No? With N things in it. Really? Oh, thank you. Log base M of M. Okay, great. Everybody up with that? Everybody's got that, right? Because that's like, you know, the property of B trees. They're shallow like that. So you can do finds quickly. Okay, now after you find key one, you gotta do this traversal. Traverse to key two, and on the way, any keys that you encounter, you report them. How are you going to do this traversal? There's one piece that you know about this that I think you might have forgotten. Remember, in order to be able to steal from your sibling, you actually have sibling pointers. So you can do stuff. Not only you can climb back up the tree because you have parent pointers, you can also go sideways if you want. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're, you're basically down at the leaf. Let's, oh, maybe we didn't find it at the leaf. Oh, okay, let's think about that. So here I am in my bee tree. And I found the key, key one. It's right there. And so what I can do is say, I'm going to try to get to key two. And one way to do that is to go down to find those things that are larger than the, uh, the key one. This right here, this X is key one. And go down and visit all of this subtree in a some sort of traversal scheme. Any, any you like it? Yes. You like in order? Pre-order? Pre-order? What kind of traversal scheme would you like to do on this thing? This is like a midterm review. What traversal do you want to do from here? How many people would like to do in-order traversal? How many people would like to do pre-order traversal? How many people would like to do post-order traversal? How many people would like to do one of those weird ones, which is like a reverse? Never mind. You want to do those? You do? You want to do one of those? That could work. Yeah, I think in order. That's the thing you want to do because you want to visit them in order so you can tell when to stop. So you do an in-order traversal from there. Whoops. In-order traversal. Until you reach. Whoops, that's an H. Until you reach key two. Or maybe you exceed. Yep. Well, if I do the pre order traversal, then I spit out something at the top of this tree 
whereas right down here might be key K2. And so it may not be, and so this is a binary search tree. I mean, it's an m -ary, not binary, m -ary search tree. And so the keys are arranged in order in this tree. And if I spit out this thing without looking down into the tree first, it could be that it looks something like that. And key two is strictly smaller than the root of this tree. And if you spit out the root, it's outside the range. You'd say, oh, it's bigger than K2. I won't do anything. I won't descend into that. No need to. But you'd be wrong, because it's in there. You just have to do an in-order for us. Okay. Any other questions about B trees? X, yeah. No, it's not. Absolutely not. It could be over here. You have to go back up. You have to. It's like you're in the middle of an in-order traversal, and you have to go back up. But you can because you have parent pointers. It's cool. And you have sibling pointers. Also cool. Okay. Uh, you might think this is one of the kookiest data structures ever. It turns out that these things are uh, are useful. So actually, uh, like large databases use these things to uh, to create indices into the data. So this is an example where we have one data set, which is a bunch of employees at the zoo, and the employees at the zoo have an employee ID and a name, and you want to be able to look up their employment record according to their ID or their name. So you want to index into the data using two different indices. This is what happens in databases, people tell me. Um, so you build two B-trees. One B-tree uses the name as a key. The other uses the employee ID as a key. And so if I look up something like Auk, I go in here and I say, where's Auk? And it says, go this way. There's Auk. And then with Auk, the little piece of data that's with Auk is a pointer, essentially an address on the disk, of where you can find the employee record. So that's the key value pair that's in the employee name B tree. You can do the same thing if you just knew the ID of Auk, like 16. You'd go into this tree and say, oh, 16 is between 15 and 20, so I better go over here. And there it is. And it's also contains this pointer to the same disk block um, so that you can get to the same employee record. So you can make many of these, one for each way in which you want to index the employee records, and they're very good. So in practice, they're, they're fast for millions and millions of employees. Got it? They're great. Now, there's also an alternative, which is you can, you can think about B trees when M is really tiny, like three. You might think, why would I ever want a B tree when M is three? These are called two, three trees, by the way, so you know they're useful because they have a name. But what is their use? I mean, why would I care? Why are they good? Search tree, you only have two. 
one or one. Yeah. That's right. So even a two three tree with m equals three has the property that all the leaves are at the same level and every node is at least half full. And those two properties together mean that the tree is shallow. So these things are shallow. And shallow here means log base two of, or log base three in that case, but anyway, the height is order log n. That means your insertion operations, your deletion and remove operations, they take a log n time. Just like they do in a, in a big B tree, a B tree with a large value of m, but now the base of the logarithm is no longer m. Well, it is m, but it's not a big m. It's a little m. It's like 2, 3. But still, the performance is just like AVL trees. We get a balanced tree structure. So now you know another balanced tree structure. You know many balanced tree structures now because you can change m to whatever you'd like, and you get a new balanced tree structure. Okay. Let's take a breath. I'll relax. Let's go back to something simple. Like cues. Remember cues? Cues were so nice. Oh, I like cues a lot. They have great applications. You put things in cues, and they come out of cues in the order in which you put them in. They're fantastic. Except when you don't want that. For example, if there's some place where there's priorities associated with things that go in the queues, like for example, oh, I don't know, you want to schedule jobs on your computer and you understand you want to minimize the average completion time of the job, then you probably want to schedule short jobs first. So you want the short ones to go in first. So short has priorities. Small is good. So, okay. Or you have events that are occurring in a simulation, a time simulation. And when those events occur, they cause new events that cause future events in, the time, in, in some time. But you want to execute these simulation of events, you want to execute them in temporal order. So every time you want to look at into the queue, you want to pull out the next thing in terms of time that's going to happen so you can simulate it and stuff the results of the simulation for that time step back into the queue so that you know what the next event is. So these sort of time-based simulations also use cues that are not regular cues. They don't, you know, there's maybe a job that's in there, or there's maybe an event that's in there that's going to happen years and years, years from now. We don't care about that, because we're dealing with events that are closer. We want to deal with the first ones first. And then when you're looking at web pages, you want to look for your most promising sites first. So you look at a site and you find out what are the possible ways that I could get to another site from here. And I'll put them into my queue, but instead of my queue being just a regular old queue, I want to prioritize because I think some sites are going to be better than others. Got it? They're called priority queues. So the priority queue has things, and those things have priorities associated with them. So here we have the employees at the zoo, and they have priorities associated with them. And we would like to pull the next thing out of the priority queue that has, in this case, uh, for whatever reason, it's kind of traditional, uh, the minimum priority thing is coming out first. You can also have a max priority if you'd like, but we're doing min priority for historical reasons. Okay, so the property is that if you have two elements in the queue and one has a lower priority than the other, then the one with lower priority is going to come out first. It's like a lineup at a rock concert and you see all the important people getting to the front of the queue while you are stuck at the back. So who comes out of this thing first? I have to write something. 
dog comes out first. Smallest, remove men. B, excellent. So B comes out with priority two. Min priority. Okay. I am never going to write the data with the priorities again. Got it? I will only write priorities and leave out the data because I'm lazy. Okay? These are applications of priority queues. We already talked about all of this stuff, except for the last one. Um, well, maybe the other one too. Uh, you can imagine, there's some great ones in here. I've forgotten about these. Okay, uh, this is actually done. Holding jobs in a printer uh, that where you want to order them by length because you want the average print time to be fast. Storing packets. When you're forwarding packets on a network, you put packets into a queue, and if there's priority associated with a packet, that one gets to go first. Uh, we talked about simulating events. This is an interesting one. Uh, you guys don't, do you know about Huffman coding? Do you ever learn about Huffman coding anywhere? Okay. You know, have you used like gzip? Or you use those sort of uh, compression programs? No, you never use those. Okay. Your computer does. Um, anyway, these things are based on a compression scheme, which basically gives priority to those things that are more frequently occurring. So when you are trying to develop a code for something, you choose the most frequently occurring things to have short codes, because that way they would result in a very short output of the compressed version. And so you use a priority queue in order to select the codes for the items. And that priority queue is prioritized by frequency of occurrence of those symbols. You can also use them to sort. You can use a priority queue, throw in all of your numbers, and then pull them out. They're sorted. Wow, that's cool. Anyway. You know how much time that's going to take, right? If I threw all the numbers into a priority queue and then I pulled them all out, how much time would that take? If I throw n numbers into a priority queue and I pull them all out, you now know that that must take time at least n items. Do you remember the sorting lower bound we talked about? What's the best sorting algorithm in the world? How fast is it? n log n. Comparison-based sorting. Best comparison-based sorting algorithm is n log n. So now you already know something about priority queues. Because if I throw n things into them and I pull them out by priority, I've sorted. So that process we know, because it's a sorting algorithm, has to take time at least n log n. So the per item cost per element cost of doing insertions and deletions from a priority queue must be at least log in. Otherwise we couldn't do it. Oh yeah, and anything greedy. So if you make locally best choices at a particular step, how do you choose what's locally best? You choose it by its priority. It's got some sort of good priority. Okay, so now you're well motivated to look at priority queues, I hope. Yes? Is it good? It depends on how quick your priority queue is. I mean, if it's really fast, then yeah. But is it going to be faster than log n to perform insertion, deletion? No, it's not. So now in your head, you're thinking, okay, the best that this thing can do is log n per operation. Because if it could do better than that, then it could sort n numbers faster than n log n, and we know that's not possible. Because we gave up on sorting. Well, we proved, actually, that we should give up. So you do know some structures already, like an unsorted list and a sorted list that could do this stuff. How much time does an unsorted list take 
to insert if you're using it as a priority queue. So if things are getting into this list, it's unsorted. What is the insert time? Yeah. It's an unsorted array or an unsorted list. Maybe it's a list. Maybe we'll make it a linked list. How much time does it take to insert into an unsorted linked list? Four to one. I just put it at the front. It's an unsorted linked list. I don't care. I'm going to pay for it, but I'm not going to pay for it on insertion. How much time does it take to remove the minimum from an unsorted linked list of n things? Well, let's just say theta then, because I don't know. Maybe it's maybe some people think that's good, some people think it's bad, but that's what it is. It's theta then, because what in the worst case could happen is you have to look through the whole thing until the minimum is a very end. How about a sorted list? What's the insertion time into a sorted list? Yeah, sadly, order in time. And what's the time to do the remove min, though? Order one, it's sitting right there at the front. Oops. So we got another one of those situations where it sure would be nice not to have to spend linear time doing one of the operations. So that's what we're going to talk about. And you know what the answer is. It's a tree. And you might even know something more about this tree. So what do you know about this tree? What properties does this tree have? I'm ready to write. Start talking. Just go ahead. It's complete. This structure looks like a complete tree. All of the levels are full except for the last level, and it's filled from left to right. Anything else? Any other properties? Yeah. It's binary. Away? Say it again. What did you say? And don't maybe change it slightly. A revision. Any other properties? Yes. The elements in each level. something about like this. Yeah. It's it's complete. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Well, yeah. Children are uh, always greater than the parents of Children. keys. Children keys. Greater than or equal to parent key. Both of the children's keys are greater than or equal to the parent key for every node in this graph. Okay, that's an interesting. Yeah. Sure, it's sort of like in a priority queue, you could have something that you don't care which, which order they come out. So you put them in with the same priority and you just say, I don't care. Whichever one comes out is fine with me. So for, this is not like a search tree structure where we're trying to implement a dictionary or something like that. But the actual abstract data type that we're trying to implement is, is really a priority queue. I mean, something that will allow us to remove the minimum, insert, delete. You know, that's We actually only want remove min. What do we want? You remove min, insert, and create, destroy, insert, remove min, and check if it's empty. That's all we want. Yeah.
Ooh. You want to you want to sort them. So you want to print them in sorted order. No, no, no. You're supposed to re you're supposed to reply to uh, the operations insert, remove min, and that's pretty much it. So those two. Yes. Yeah, that's what you want to do. So what order traversal did you say? No, um, I mean, it could be that 5 is over here and 4 is over there. I mean, it could be that 5 and 4 are switched and still have this property. This is the property that this, this is actually the property because, as you can see, there are certain situations where the parent, uh, it always has a smaller key value, but it doesn't always have the fact that the left child is smaller than the right child or, the, or vice versa. It's it's weird. It's a very flexible thing. Yep. Uh, we'll do the wobble order so it's each wobble after is bigger than the wobble before. No, because nine is less than ten. And I'm not asking you to sort. That's one thing you can do with these structures, but it's not the only thing you can do with these structures. There are other things you can do with them. All I'm asking is for remove min. And we know where remove min is going to remove it. We know where the minimum is. So because of this property, property number three, where is the minimum? It can't be anywhere else. If the minimum in this tree was anywhere else, then its parent would be unhappy. Because the parent has to be smaller than its children. The way things should be. Okay, so these these two, number one and number three, we're going to monkey around with binary maybe later, but let's also say binary. Uh, so all three of these properties. This is called a structure property. It's telling you what the structure of this thing is. It looks like a complete tree. And this is an ordering property. It's talking about the way in which the data is distributed within this tree. It has to be distributed so that the parent is always smaller than the children. And because of that, we know where the minimum is. Because of that, we also know if I wanted to add something, insert something into the tree, I know exactly where it's going to go. That's the structural property. So insert must be filling that spot. Now you say that's crazy because what if I insert the number two or the number one? Well, we have to do something, but we know that in the outcome of this insertion is going to be a complete tree in which all of these nodes are, and we have an extra node. So insert is always going to enter there. Now we might have to fix things. Okay, so right now, uh, be a good time to think about how we're going to do this stuff. We have to do remove min because we can't just chop off the top of the tree. Then it's not the tree anymore. And how to do insert because we can't just cram something into the spot at the end because if we did, it could be in the wrong spot. We have to do something. So we'll think about insert first. No, we won't. I have to tell you the nifty storage trick. Oh, this is the best. We have two, two minutes to do this. Oh, this is good. Um, if I have a complete tree, I don't have to store a pointer. I can just store the whole thing in an array. And you look at this and you say, of course you can do that. All you've done is written little blue numbers on top of the nodes in this particular order. And then you've stuffed the values that are in those nodes underneath an index, which is that little blue number. That's not rocket science. Yes, you're right. It's not rocket science. But what is the child's index if I give you the parent's index? Like if I tell you, I'm interested in the children of node number four, the blue number four. Who are the children of node number four? Where do they live? And you look and you say, I don't know, nine and ten. But how do you get from four to nine and ten?
The left child of four is where? Pardon me? Two times i plus one. And the right child of i You can now navigate this tree by just doing arithmetic. You don't have any pointers, you're just doing arithmetic. Totally cool. Okay, we have to go. But this is the best thing. Uh, this is fantastic. Very succinct data structure.